with new emerging technologies, the world today is brimming with a lot of possibilities. We are now equipped with the knowledge to make vaccines and medicines and counter diseases that can cause epidemics. It is also possible to grow crops which are disease and drought resistant. And the science which makes all this possible is called biotechnology. It is a field of applied biology consisting of various techniques which utilize organisms or their enzymes to produce useful products for human beings. As a science, biotechnology differs from microbe-mediated processes such as the making of curd and cheese because it uses genetically modified organisms and operates on a much larger scale. Biotechnology techniques are useful in various fields such as engineering, technology and cell and tissue culture. Many specialized processes such as synthesizing and using a gene, developing DNA vaccines, in vitro fertilization and developing biofuels all fall within the purview of biotechnology. Interestingly, human beings have been applying the techniques of biotechnology unknowingly for a very long time. For example, agriculture is the oldest biotechnological system used to create new products. Agriculture gave rise to the selection of high-yielding varieties to get a better crop and the use of specific organisms for fertilizers to restore nitrogen and control pests. However, the modern biotechnology arose from two core techniques, namely genetic engineering and chemical engineering processes. Genetic engineering is a specialized branch of science which involves the use of several techniques to modify the genetic material that is DNA and RNA of an organism. The changed genetic material is then introduced into the host organism to change its phenotype. On the other hand, chemical engineering processes deal with the application of physical sciences, life sciences and mathematics to the process of converting chemicals into valuable forms. Biotechnology helps in the maintenance of a sterile environment by enabling the growth of only desired microbes in large quantities during chemical processes while making antibiotics, vaccines and enzymes. Let us now understand some of the principles of genetic engineering that have been used for biotechnology. Techniques such as gene cloning, recombinant DNA and gene transfer help to isolate and select only desirable genes and avoid the transfer of undesirable genes in target organisms. This helps improve traditional hybridization procedures where undesirable genes often get included. Gene cloning refers to the production of a lineage of cells which contain one kind of DNA fragment of interest derived from a population of many kinds of DNA fragments. A DNA piece will not be able to multiply in the progeny cells of the host organism if it is transferred randomly.
the replication can only take place in a chromosome with a specific DNA sequence called the origin of replication, which initiates replication. Another genetic engineering technique is recombinant DNA. This is artificial DNA created from two or more sources and incorporated into a single recombinant molecule. A recombinant DNA molecule was constructed for the first time by Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer in 1972. Through the various experiments conducted by him, Boyer had confirmed about the useful properties of the restriction enzymes of the E. coli bacterium. The restriction enzymes helped in cutting out double-stranded or single-stranded DNA at specific locations also known as the restriction sites. Boyer found out that the restriction enzymes could cut DNA strands in a particular fashion which left the sticky ends on the strands. Stanley Cohen, on the other hand, had specialized in the study of small ringlets of DNA called plasmids, which float about freely in the cytoplasm of certain bacterial cells such as E. coli. These plasmids also replicate independently from the coding strand of DNA. Cohen had developed the method of removing these plasmids from the cell and reinserting them in other cells. Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer combined their processes and thus the first DNA recombinant molecule was constructed. They inserted the gene that encodes for antibiotic resistance into a native plasmid of Salmonella typhimurium. They isolated the antibiotic resistance gene by cutting out a piece of DNA from a plasmid which was responsible for this genetic trait. This process of cutting out DNA at specific locations was facilitated by restriction enzymes. In this experiment, the plasmid DNA acted as vector to transfer the DNA piece attached to it. The antibiotic resistance gene was linked with the plasmid vector with the help of enzyme DNA ligase, which joined the ends of the cut DNA molecules. Therefore, it led to the creation of a new combination of circular, self-replicating DNA, also known as recombinant DNA. On transferring this DNA into E. coli, it was observed that multiple copies of the genetic material could be made by using the new host's DNA polymerase enzyme. This process of making multiple copies of the antibiotic resistance gene in E. coli was also known as cloning of the antibiotic resistance gene in E. coli. Another genetic engineering technique was gene transfer, which involves the insertion of unrelated genetic information in the form of DNA into the cells. Gene transfer is used to provide essential genes to patients in the treatment of some diseases such as type 1 diabetes and cystic fibrosis. With constant developments in its techniques, Biotechnology is fast evolving and contributing to diverse fields such as healthcare, crop production and waste management. The construction of recombinant DNA molecules is a very sophisticated scientific technique involving the use of several key tools, one of which is restriction enzymes. These enzymes are isolated from bacteria that recognize specific sequences in DNA. Then, they are used to cut the DNA to produce restriction fragments.
restriction enzymes are assumed to provide a defense mechanism against several deadly viruses such as bacteriophages. They belong to a higher class of enzymes called nucleases, which have the ability to cleave the phosphodiester bonds between the nucleotide subunits of nucleic acids. The nucleases are categorized as exonucleases and endonucleases. Exonucleases remove nucleotides from the end of the polynucleotide chain. They hydrolyze phosphodiester bonds of terminal nucleotides, while endonucleases cut the DNA at specific points and are thus known as molecular scissors. Let's study how restriction endonuclease was discovered. In 1963, scientists Stuart Lynn and Werner Arber were successful in isolating the enzymes responsible for restricting the growth of bacteriophage in E. coli. One of these enzymes methylated the host DNA, while the other cut the foreign DNA. The second enzyme was called restriction endonuclease. Thereafter, in 1968, scientists H.O. Smith, K.W. Wilcox and T.J. Kelly, while working on Haemophilus influenzae, isolated an enzyme called HIND2. HIND2 was the first restriction endonuclease whose functioning depended on a specific DNA nucleotide sequence. It was observed that HIND2 always cut DNA molecules at a particular point by recognizing the position of the six base pairs. Therefore, the specific base sequence is also known as the recognition sequence for HIND2. Today, more than 900 restriction enzymes have been isolated from around 230 strains of bacteria, each of which recognizes different recognition sequences. Restriction enzymes are named using a specific convention. Let's take the example of restriction enzyme ECOR1, which is derived from the bacteria Escherichia coli. The first letter of the name E is derived from the genus, while the next two letters, CO, come from the species of the prokaryotic cell from which these genes were isolated. R refers to the strain, while the Roman number indicates the order in which the enzyme was isolated from the strain of bacteria. Restriction endonuclease plays a crucial role in the construction of the recombinant DNA molecule. It recognizes a specific recognition sequence, so it binds to the DNA and cuts the double-stranded DNA helix at specific points on its sugar phosphate backbones. The specific recognition sequence actually identifies a palindrome in the DNA. Observe that the following sequence reads the same on the two DNA strands in 5' to 3' direction and vice versa. In a palindrome, the base sequence of the second half in the DNA strand represents the mirror image of the base sequence in the first half. Due to this, in the DNA double helix, the complementary strand also represents the same mirror image. Restriction endonucleases cut the DNA strand slightly away from the center of the palindrome sites. However, this cut is between the same two bases on the opposite DNA strands. As a result, single-stranded portions are left at the ends. Moreover, there are overhanging stretches called sticky ends on each strand. Such ends are called sticky or cohesive ends because base pairing between them can stick the DNA molecule together again. Thus, restriction endonucleases play a crucial role in the construction of recombinant DNA molecules 
which have DNA from different sources. When the same restriction enzyme cuts different DNA molecules, all of them are left with similar sticky ends, which can be linked using DNA ligase. Therefore, restriction enzymes are very useful tools used by molecular biologists to manipulate DNA for scientific applications. Imagine placing foreign DNA in a bacterium. Will this DNA multiply? It will not, as the bacterium will not recognize the foreign DNA. To get recognized and to multiply, foreign DNA requires some identification sequences or replicon. These identification sequences are provided by a cloning vector. It is a DNA molecule which has an origin of replication and is capable of replicating in a bacterial cell. Most cloning vectors are genetically engineered plasmids or bacteriophages. Typically, the number of bacteriophages per cell is quite high. Therefore, the copy number of their genome in the bacterial cell is also quite high. On the other hand, the copy number of the plasmid genome varies from 1 or 2 copies to 15 to 100 copies per bacterial cell or more. When we link an alien piece of DNA with bacteriophage or plasmid DNA, we can multiply its number to be equal to the copy number of the plasmid or bacteriophage. The first artificial plasmid, which is now commonly used as a cloning vector, is PBR322. It was created in 1977 and was named after its Mexican creators, Bolivar and Rodriguez. Let us now review the main features that facilitate cloning into a vector such as PBR322. These features are origin of replication, selectable markers, and cloning sites. The origin of replication, or ORI, is a sequence of DNA at which replication gets initiated in a plasmid. When a DNA piece is linked to this sequence, it can be made to replicate within the host cells. This sequence also controls the copy number of the linked DNA. Therefore, whenever one has to recover many copies of the target DNA, it should be cloned in a vector whose origin supports a high copy number. The vector also requires a selectable marker due to which a plasmid is more useful for the cell. Selectable markers help identify and eliminate non-transformants and exclusively permit the growth of transformants. For example, in E. coli, the genes encoding resistance to various antibiotics such as ampicillin, chloramphenicol, tetracycline or canamycin are used as selectable markers. Another important feature of a cloning vector is a cloning site which is an artificially constructed region within a vector molecule containing a number of closely spaced recognition sequences. These sequences or recognition sites can recognize several restriction enzymes and therefore the vector can be used to clone a variety of DNA samples. However, the presence of more than one recognition site may lead to complications in gene cloning. In the cloning vector, 
BBR322, the ligation of alien DNA is also carried out at a restriction site present in any one of the two antibiotic resistance genes, which are ampicillin and tetracycline. Let's take the example of foreign DNA which can be ligated at the BAM H1 site of the tetracycline resistance gene. When foreign DNA is ligated at the BAM H1 site, it disrupts the tetracycline gene and consequently the recombinant plasmids will lose tetracycline resistance. Transformants growing on the ampicillin containing medium are transferred to a tetracycline containing medium. In the tetracycline medium, there is no growth of transformants. Meanwhile, non recombinants grow on the medium containing both the antibiotics. Therefore, while one antibiotic resistance gene helps select the transformants, the other one gets inactivated due to insertion, thereby helping in the selection of recombinants. The selection of recombinants due to inactivation is a difficult procedure. Therefore, different selectable markers have been developed which can differentiate between recombinant and non-recombinants by producing a color in the presence of a chromogenic substrate. For example, when a fragment of DNA is inserted in the middle of the coding sequence of an enzyme beta-galactosidase, it results in the inactivation of a beta-galactosidase gene. Due to the addition of extra codes, any future products from the inactivated gene will not work. This is known as insertional inactivation. When the plasmid that has undergone insertional activation comes in contact with a chromogenic substrate, colorless bacterial colonies can be observed. These colonies are also identified as recombinant colonies. On the other hand, if the plasmid in the bacterium does not have an insert of foreign DNA fragment, the chromogenic substrate yields blue colonies. Interestingly, human beings have learnt about cloning vectors and the concept of gene transfer into plants and animals from bacteria and viruses. Consider the case of Agrobacterium tumefaciens, a pathogen of several dicot plants which causes tumors in them. It delivers a piece of DNA known as tDNA and transforms normal plant cells into tumor cells. These tumor cells are used by the pathogen to produce chemicals such as nopaline required by it. By understanding how pathogens deliver genes in their hosts, scientists have been able to transform the pathogen into useful cloning vectors. For instance, the tumor-inducing agrobacterium tumefaciens has been modified into a cloning vector TI plasmid, which is not pathogenic to plants. In fact, the TI plasmid vector uses the same mechanism to deliver other genes of interest in plants. Once we have obtained the recombinant DNA molecule using a cloning vector, another challenge is introducing this recombinant DNA in the host cells. In DNA, the deoxyribose sugar and the phosphates are hydrophilic in nature. Therefore, cannot pass through the cell membranes. To overcome this problem, bacterial cells have to be made competent to take up plasmids. 
therefore, they are treated with divalent cation like calcium. This enhances the efficiency of the entry of DNA into a bacterium through pores on the cell wall. After this, recombinant DNA can be forced into such cells by incubation of cells with recombinant DNA on ice. This process is followed by administering a heat shock to the cells at around 42 degrees Celsius and putting them back on ice. After this, the bacteria are able to take up the recombinant DNA. Apart from cloning vectors, foreign DNA fragments can also be introduced into host cells using methods such as microinjection and biolistics or a gene gun. The microinjection method involves the direct injection of recombinant DNA into the nucleus of an animal cell. While in the biolistics or gene gun method, plant cells are bombarded with high velocity microparticles of gold or tungsten coated with DNA. This method uses disarmed pathogen vectors which when allowed to infect the cell transfer the recombinant DNA into the host. The use of cloning vectors and methods such as microinjection and biolistics are crucial in genetic engineering as they help create genes of human and scientific interest. Recombinant DNA technology has gained paramount importance in the 21st century. In times when agriculture is faced with challenges such as drought, diseased crops and poor yield, this technology has a vital role to play in developing better crops. Recombinant DNA technology has also helped produce medicines to prevent and cure diseases such as sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis. Recombinant DNA technology is a sophisticated process involving many steps. In order of sequence, these steps are isolation of genetic material or DNA, fragmentation of DNA by restriction endonucleases, amplification of the gene of interest, insertion of recombinant DNA into a host cell or organism, obtaining the foreign gene product, and downstream processing. Let us understand the processes that help carry out the first three steps successfully. The genetic material in most organisms comprises DNA. In recombinant DNA technology, the first step is to select and isolate the piece of DNA of interest to be inserted into a cloning vector. Then, this piece of DNA is cut using restriction enzymes. To cut with restriction enzymes, the DNA should be in a pure form. That is, it should be free of macromolecules. To obtain DNA, a sample of cells is generally blended or ground thoroughly. This helps separate the cells from each other. Now, in order to isolate DNA, enzymes such as lysozyme, cellulase and chitinase are used to treat bacterial cells, plant cells and fungal cells respectively. DNA is enclosed in the cell membranes along with macromolecules such as RNA lipids, polysaccharides and proteins. Genes are located on long chains of DNA which are intertwined with proteins such as histones. These proteins can be removed by treating them with proteas, an enzyme used to break down proteins.
On the other hand, RNA can be removed by treating it with ribonuclease. Similarly, other molecules can be removed using specific treatments. Finally, after the addition of chilled ethanol, DNA is isolated as a precipitate. This extracted DNA can be collected using a method called spooling. After isolation of DNA, in the next stage, restriction enzymes are used to cut the purified DNA molecules at specific locations. This cutting results in DNA fragmentation. The fragmented DNA can be separated according to its molecular weight by using a technique known as gel electrophoresis. It is employed to check the progression of restriction enzyme digestion. Typically, the gels used in this process are prepared using agarose. DNA molecules are separated across a pan of gel motivated by an electrical current. Activated electrodes located at either end of the gel chamber produce an electric field. Since DNA is a negatively charged molecule, due to the presence of phosphate groups, it moves towards the positive pole. The separation of fragments occurs according to each fragment's properties, which determine how fast the electric field can move the molecules across the gel. The bigger the DNA fragment, the slower it moves towards the positive pole. Therefore, smaller fragments reach the bottom of the gel first. The separated DNA fragments on the gel can be seen only after staining the DNA with ethidium bromide. Now, the separated DNA bands are cut from the agarose gel and extracted from the gel piece. This step is called cution or elution. Stained agarose gel with DNA fragments can be seen under the UV light chamber. Later, the cutout piece of the source DNA or the foreign DNA fragment and the cut plasmid DNA are joined with the help of enzyme DNA ligase. Scientists need a significant number of DNA samples for molecular and genetic studies. Therefore, the next step is the amplification of the gene of interest. The extracted DNA sample can be amplified or used to make multiple copies by using a technique known as polymerase chain reaction or PCR. The PCR technique was developed by Carrie B. Mullis who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1993. PCR has three steps, denaturation, primer annealing, and extension of primers. In the first step, the isolated or extracted target DNA segment to be amplified is heated to 95 degrees centigrade for denaturation. This leads to the separation of two single strands. In the second step, the solution is cooled to around 55 degrees centigrade in the presence of oligonucleotide primers that are complementary to DNA regions. Now, two oligonucleotide primers anneal or hybridize to each single-stranded template DNA. Annealing sequences are located at the prime ends of two strands of the desired segment. In the third step, the temperature is raised again to 72 degrees centigrade. Now an enzyme called TAC polymerase is used to build two new strands of DNA using the original strands as templates. TAC polymerase is isolated from the bacterium Thermus aquaticus. It helps extend primers towards each other so that the DNA segment lying between two primers is copied. Later, each of these strands can be used to create two new copies every time.
The cycle of denaturing and synthesizing of DNA is repeated 30 to 40 times to get 30 to 40 billion copies of the original DNA. The PCR is an automated technique which can be completed in just a few hours. It is executed by a machine called a thermocycler which is programmed to alter the temperature of the reaction every few minutes to allow DNA denaturing and synthesis. These first three steps, isolation of DNA, fragmentation by restriction endonuclease, and amplification of gene of interest, are important steps in recombinant DNA technology that are carried out using specific techniques. Recombinant DNA technology is an important tool in understanding the structure, function, and regulation of genes and their products. It is a complex step-by-step -step process. The first few steps in DNA recombinant technology involve the isolation of the genetic material, fragmentation of DNA by restriction endonucleases, and amplification of a gene of interest. Once the foreign DNA has been extracted, the next steps are insertion of recombinant DNA into the host cell or organism, obtaining the foreign G product, and downstream processing. Let's understand the techniques used to carry out the last three steps. Insertion of recombinant DNA into the host cell is one of the most challenging steps as first the bacterial cell has to be made competent to receive the DNA. If we consider the insertion of a recombinant DNA-bearing gene for ampicillin into the host cell E. coli, the host cells will become ampicillin-resistant. Thereafter, when the host cells are spread on agar plates containing ampicillin, only the transformants will grow. On the other hand, non-transformant recipient cells will die. In this case, the ampicillin-resistant gene acts as a selectable marker since it identifies and eliminates non-transformants and permits the growth of transformants. Let us now understand how to obtain a target protein from a foreign gene of recombinant DNA. If any protein encoding gene is expressed in many hosts such as plant cells, bacterial cells and fungal cells, it is called a recombinant protein. Cultures such as an ampicillin medium may be used to extract the desired protein. Then this protein can be purified by using different separation techniques such as nitrocellulose filter and autoradiography. After the purification process, the cells storing cloned genes of interest may be grown on a small scale in the laboratory. These cells can also be multiplied in a continuous culture system in which the used medium such as ampicillin is drained from one side, while a fresh medium is added from the other so that the cells can be allowed to remain in their most exponential phase. Therefore, a continuous culturing system produces a large number of cells with recombinant DNA or biomass, which results in higher yields of the desired protein. To produce biomass in even larger quantities, a bioreactor is used. It is a vessel used to carry out a chemical process. A bioreactor uses raw material such as microbial plant, animal or human cells, and converts it into products such as enzymes. About a hundred to a thousand liters of culture can be processed in such units. It facilitates the growth of a large volume of biomass by providing optimum growth conditions in terms of temperature, pH level, substrate, salts, vitamins and oxygen. The most commonly used bioreactor is the stirred tank type, which consists of a large stainless steel vessel 
with a capacity of up to 500,000 decimeter cube. Around the steel vessel is a jacket of circulatory water used to control the temperature inside the bioreactor. There is also an agitator inside the bioreactor comprising a series of flat blades which can be rotated with the help of a motor. This ensures thorough mixing of the contents so that nutrients come in close contact with the microorganisms. The agitator also prevents settling of the cells at the bottom. The bioreactor also makes adequate provision for aeration, temperature and pH control. For proper aeration, air can be forced in at the bottom of the tank through a porous ring called the sparging ring by a process called sparging. Moreover, there is an outlet to remove air and waste gases at the top of the tank. The top of the tank also has a number of inlet tubes called ports through which materials can be introduced or withdrawn. For example, the inoculation port is used to introduce initial inoculums and the nutrient port to introduce more nutrients. Similarly, the antifoam port is used to introduce antifoaming agents while the pH port to introduce acids or alkalis to maintain optimal pH. At the base of the tank, there is a harvest line to extract the culture medium and microbial products. Another type of bioreactor is the one with a sparged stirred tank. Sterile air bubbles are sparged through this reactor, which increases the surface area for oxygen transfer. Once the biomass has been obtained from the bioreactor, the final step in the recombinant DNA technology is downstream processing. It refers to the recovery and purification of biosynthetic products such as pharmaceuticals before they are brought to the market as finished products. In downstream processing, pharmaceutical products such as antibiotics and hormones are formulated with suitable preservatives. Thereafter, these products are also subjected to clinical trials and quality testing. By aiding in the development of these new medicines and vaccines, recombinant DNA technology has revolutionized medical science and opened new vistas of research.